You may remember shortly after he won in 2016, but before he was sworn in, Donald Trump famously came to Indiana to the Carrier Heating and Air Conditioning Factory, along with Mike Pence, to make a big show about he personally having saved over 1,100 jobs from going to Mexico. Thanks to the initiative and the leadership of President-elect Donald Trump, a carrier has decided to stay and grow right here in America. Companies are not going to leave the United States anymore without consequences. But the deal was largely smoke and mirrors, and Carrier would go on to have round after round of layoffs. Hundreds of jobs did, in fact, go to Mexico, where workers make around three bucks an hour. And the laid-off Carrier workers who voted for Trump, like Renee Elliott, were left to fend for themselves. I felt like he was going to protect our jobs, you know what I mean? We all voted for him. And then, boom. I felt betrayed. And joining us here tonight, we have Renee Elliott, who you saw there. She was also in the room when the man that she voted for came to Carrier to take credit for saving her job, which she then was uh, lost. We have another Carrier worker, Frank Staples. He is now out on medical leave. He was a worker at Carrier for 14 years, and he wrote in Bernie Sanders in the 2016 presidential election. We have Susan Cropper, who's laid off from her job at United Technologies after 31 years on the job. She voted for Donald Trump as well in 2016. And rounding our group, Dora Boyd, she's a single mother who works in a restaurant and voted for Hillary Clinton. Um, let me start with you, Renee, because, you know, Donald Trump came to places like Fort Wayne and said very clearly, like, I am not going to let the jobs leave. He came here and said, I'm not going to let Carrier leave. And then they left. What do you feel about the guy now? Ah, uh, Phil duped. I, I don't have a lot of faith in political candidates much anymore. You know, they um, they make promises. You know, they, they make them and they break them. <laughs> How about you, Susan? How do you feel? About like Renee, you know, um, I just feel like I've been betrayed, let down. I thought Trump was going to really secure American jobs, and, and that's just not what's happening out there at all. Um, the jobs that were saved in the Indy plant were never going to leave to begin with. So, so you feel like it was a con? Oh, absolutely. Senator, there are, there are you know, this was the, one of the key parts of the appeal, I think, in certain parts of the industrial Midwest, particularly to white vote voters in the industrial Midwest, which was, I will save your jobs. What do, what do you say to folks like Renee or Susan, and there are a lot more out there, folks in Lordstown, to say, listen, you should listen to what I have to tell you. Okay, so the thing is, you can't just wave your arms, you know that. It's that you really gotta have a plan. And I do have a plan on this. So here's how it starts. I'm looking to make about 1.2 million new jobs. New jobs that are good jobs, that are jobs in manufacturing, that are gonna be good union jobs. The kind of jobs on which people can build a future. And here's the idea behind it. Right now, we got a climate crisis in this country and in this world. It threatens us all. Worldwide, there's about a $23 trillion market for fighting back against climate change. And that's going to mean a lot of research, a lot of innovation, and a lot of manufacturing to push back against that. My plan is to make America the leader in that fight. We double down, triple down, go tenfold on the research from where it's been before. And we say to anybody who wants to use that research, who wants to innovate around it, good for you. You can do it, but you have to produce the products right here in the United States of America. You have to build those jobs here. If American tax are the ones who are going to foot the bill for the research, then by golly, it's going to produce good American jobs right here. So that's one part. One more part is a commitment to spend about a trillion and a half dollars in making our federal government go green. It's buy the products, and here again, it's going to be all buy American. We're going to change our fleet of cars. We're going to bring in new products. We're going to change what happens with our buildings. And look what that does. That not only helps improve on the climate front, but it creates demand. 
demand to keep those factories open, demand to expand those factories and those jobs. And then there's one more part to it. And that is, look, even if we manage to go entirely carbon neutral by 2030, we're only about 20% of the world on this. There's another 80%. And that's where the worldwide demand for change is. So huge market, $23 trillion market. Right now, the Chinese spend 100 times what we spend here in the United States marketing their manufactured products around the world. I say we're going to spend that money in the United States to market American products around the world. That's how we're going to produce these products. What, what we're going to do, yes, there is a climate crisis, but what are we going to do about the opioid crisis that we have going on here? Oh. So many. I mean, you know, it's in the inner cities, and it's the younger generation, you yep. know, the ones, you know, my kids' age, I see um, everywhere. And it's, it's, it's so much so now that you cannot ignore it. You know what I mean? It, it's bad. So... <sighs> I have a plan for this. <laughs> Let's <hear> One, it. <laughs> and it's, it's already out there. It's, it's with Elijah Cummings, congressman from Maryland. We've got over 100 co-sponsors right now between the House and the Senate. And here's how this plan works. It starts with exactly what you said, and that is how big this problem is. You realize just something short of 200 people will die today from an overdose. It's like a plane crash. And another one tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And here's the deal. The problem keeps getting bigger, and right now, the federal government just keeps nibbling behind it. We spend a little more, we spend a little more, but the problem gets bigger. If someone came to you who loves you and said, I know I got a problem, they have a less than one in six chance of getting the medical help that they need. Why? Not because we don't know what to do, but because right now we won't make the investment to help them. Not enough beds, not enough doctors, not enough rehab centers. So my plan with Congressman Cummings is over the next 10 years, we're going to put $100 billion, I've already got this paid for, $100 billion in to hit this opioid crisis head on and bring it to its knees. We've got to save the people we love. I want to, just for seven, I want to, I want to circle back around to, 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 to the feasibility of plans. Because sure. I think that's a, a question. But, Dory, you had a question first. Yes. I'm, yeah. a, I'm, I'm a single mother. My main concern is my child. The children are the future. What is your plan for that? And also for people that have to pick whether you're going to pay, if you're going to work a full-time job to pay for child care or if you're going to work a full-time job and hope you can rely on somebody that, because in my perspective, everyone doesn't have an aunt like yours. Yeah. So what is your plan for that? So, as you know, this one's really personal for me. When I got my first full-time teaching job, I had two little ones under feet, and I, I loved that job. I was so excited by that job. But there I was, you know, I'm still doing dinner at eight o'clock at night, I'm giving baths at nine o'clock, get them into bed and I've got three loads of laundry and then I got my class preps. It was hard, but I could do hard. The part I couldn't do was when the babysitter quit. And then when the daycare center turned out to be a mess. And then when the second daycare center said, no, they were moving. And then one more and one more and one more. And then there was the night. Kids were in bed, my Aunt B called and said, how you doing, honey? She's my widowed Aunt B from Oklahoma. And I said, fine. And then I burst into tears. And I said, I wanna quit. It just, it's like it just fell out of my mouth. You know what this is like, Renee. And Aunt B listened while I cried and I cried. And finally I blew my nose, got myself back together. And she said the words that changed my life. She said, I can't get there tomorrow, but I'll come on Thursday. She arrived with seven suitcases and a Pekingese named Buddy and stayed for 16 years. And that's how I got <laughs> to have a job. But it's just like you said. If everybody in the world had an Aunt B, we'd all be fine. But they don't. So this is a big priority for me. What I've got is a two cent wealth tax 
on the biggest fortunes in this country, the top one tenth of one percent. Anybody who's already made fifty million dollars, the fifty millionth and first dollar, we're going to do two cent tax. They pitch in that two cents and two cents on every dollar after that. That'll give us enough money to do universal child care for every baby age zero to five, universal pre K for every three year old and four year old, and raise the wages of every child care worker and preschool teacher to the levels that they deserve. That's how it is. Look, High quality child care early on, high quality pre K, that's all the difference in the world. And that should not be reserved for the children of the well to do. That's an investment we should Senator, make in every child in this country. So, I'm at Senator's already, that's, I count three plans already that have been okay. rolled out. So there's three plans. I still got more. I know you do. I know you do. I've been on your website. Um, I want to talk a little bit about like whether the plans can be reality, right? I mean, you can. Anyone can put something on. Donald Trump can come to a place like Fort Wayne and say, and he did, and he could say, I am waving the magic wand, and you're never going to see, it, and the jobs are coming back. The question is. How do you make that a reality? Can you make that a reality? I want to talk to you folks about that and the senator right after we take this quick break. Don't go anywhere. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.